a year and some change. Um, I did not memorize this at all. I only just read it out loud for the first time yesterday, so I'm gonna be looking down a whole bunch. Um, <laughs> all right, so. We have wandered in the wilderness of separate but equal, and we're about to move to the promised land of creative integration. And I don't know whether I'll be there, but my people will get to the promised land. Dr. King said that to his crew of organizers only a few months before he was assassinated. This last summer, I was lucky enough to be a delegate for Austin at the National DSA Convention. Our first night in Atlanta, after a day of traveling and socializing, I found myself at the King Center with a few comrades. Buses were no longer running, bars were closed for the night, and we were faced with Dr. King's six principles of nonviolence. Nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. Nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. Nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. Nonviolence hopes that suffering can educate and transform. Nonviolence accepts suffering without retaliation. Nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. Nonviolence believes that the universe is on the side of justice. These principles are paramount to our fight, but in order to fight, you have to know your enemies. One of the, of the three evils, as Dr. King coined them, is poverty. Poverty is homelessness. Poverty is illiteracy. Poverty is underpaying jobs. Poverty is our bosses keeping us from organizing for better working conditions. Fighting to end poverty by participating in a labor movement is why Dr. King was murdered by the United States of America. As a preacher, organizer, and anti-capitalist, he was a threat. How can you take down the legacy of a man who is so deeply Christian and a fighter for workers around the world? Easy, by erasing his labor organizing, by not popularizing the dozens of speeches that were given at union meetings. In order to have a working class movement, the conversation has to address labor and workers' power. Dr. King knew that voter suppression is just one thread of the American imperialist quilt. Once his focus grew from racism to intersect with classism, the wealthy knew that they would be in trouble. Those in power know that racism is only a piece of the systemic oppression we live under. Once Dr. King's view, vision grew to abolish poverty, he became a national problem, a global problem. What good is having the right to sit at a lunch counter if you can't afford to buy a hamburger? I was never taught that Dr. King was a democratic socialist. I was never taught about his work in the labor, labor movement. Why? Our country, among other colonized nations, are experts in erasing history, altering reality to fit the wealthy class's narrative. Whenever Dr. King is quoted, it is typically about the uniting little black and white kids. And that's it. No further discussion on what was actually happening in our country from 1950 to the end of the civil rights movement. You can't simultaneously teach us to idolize King as a personification of what is morally right while forcing us to live in such a capitalistic, violent society. So what is missing from the discussion? What's beyond the bus boycott? What, was it just about black folks wanting to sit up front? Of course not. Black folks were working long, long hours, putting in labor for the wealthier class without giving any agency on where they could eat, sit, or spend their free time. The march in Washington was not just a moment to sing Kumbaya in Washington while holding hands with our neighbors. The march was a demonstration of all poor people in our country organizing together to demand jobs with livable wages. Labor organizing encompasses every aspect of what our movement should be working toward. A society where folks producing labor will receive the fruit. A society where folks aren't discriminated from jobs because of gender, sex, race, religion, or ability. Working class people outnumber the 1% globally by a staggering number. Those in charge are fully aware of this fact and have done a fantastic job of keeping us so tired we don't have energy to organize. We struggle to keep our jobs, keep our homes, feed our families, and get the medical attention we need and deserve. We look at other working class folks as, as if they are our enemy. King was brought into the Montgomery bus, bus boycott by a union leader. The March in Washington for Jobs and Freedom was organized by Dr. King and union leaders from across the country. When jailed in Birmingham, King was bailed out by union dues. King was murdered while in Memphis collaborating with striking sanitation union workers. 
The words Yan and Martin Luther King Jr. were never uttered in the same breath in my schools. If children are taught about Yan's organized workers and strikes, then the wealthy class would be screwed. They rely on keeping us scared, unorganized, and uneducated. We are fed the American loving, peace to all Reverend King, an organizer who was nonviolent, popular with all demographics, and a patriot. I was never taught the I have a dream speech with any deep contextualizing why so many Americans are living in poverty. At times, the lesson seemed to be if we are all nice and kind to each other, all the other problems would vanish. As a democratic socialist, socialist I know that to be false and dangerous. Moderates were terrified of Dr. King's vision of eradicating poverty because they believed that would disrupt their comfortable lives. And we're very obviously seeing that currently with certain elections. The shortcomings of the first phase of the civil rights movement to King was his emphasis on opportunity rather than guarantees. The ability to buy a hamburger at a lunch counter without harassment did not guarantee that the hungry would be fed. Access to the ballot box did not guarantee anti-racist legislation. The end of Jim Crow laws did not guarantee the flourishing of African-American communities. Decency did not guarantee equality. Some white people had gone along with the fight for access and opportunity, King concluded, because it cost them nothing. Jobs, however, are harder and costlier to create than voting roles. When African-Americans sought not only to be treated with dignity, but guaranteed fair housing and education, many whites abandoned the movement. In King's words, as soon as he demanded the realization of equality, the second phase of the civil rights movement, the labor phase of the civil rights movement, he discovered whites suddenly different, indifferent. The Santa Claus classification, a term coined by Cornel West of King, teaches that the struggle is just against the evil thoughts of Southerners and the weapons he used to fight it in, in civil disobedience was just changing people through virtue. This erases that the civil rights leaders had a clear theory of power. They chose their targets carefully based on the resources they had. When they were small and didn't have the power to damage Southern governments, they targeted bus lines and single diners and they shut them down. They selected targets they could make pay and they organized accordingly. King's move towards supporting labor organizing was a new theory of power. It was the same theory as a lar at a larger scale that the way to win was to make the, powerful pay, make the powerful pay, and the way to make them pay was to shut it all down. Capitalism has grown to its monstrous level because there has not been a mass worker movement in decades. Capitalism survives because workers are taught to praise the wealthy class with the false hope that they too will live horrendously luxurious lifestyles if they work hard enough. Capitalism thrives by murdering leaders of worker class movements. And just to be completely clear, there is no economic justice without racial justice. There is no racial justice without economic justice. There will never be a working class revolution if we aren't organizing globally. Reverend King didn't start radicalized. He's not Fred Hampton or Malcolm X, where his political education started with viewing our entire system as illegitimate. He started off as a preacher, looking after his congregation and winning specific material gains for his community. The process of asking why people were impoverished, what forces produced segregation, and what plights unite us led to further radicalization over time. There's a reason why we aren't taught about the Poor People's Campaign. There's a reason why we aren't taught labor history. There's a reason why the Civil Rights Act and the Voters' Rights Act were passed and black people were expected to shut up and be happy. It's much easier for moderates to politely apologize for racism, but when your organizing begins to affect their money, you become a problem. If those in power admit that our poverty has been created by their exploitation, then the assumption is that they will have to pay back their debts. So I'll leave you with this quote from his speech in support of the Memphis Sanitation Workers, Workers Strike, March 18th, 1968, before he was assassinated in his Memphis hotel. You are doing many things here in this struggle. You are demanding that this city will respect the dignity of labor. So often we overlook the work and the significance of those who are not in professional jobs, of those who are not in the so-called big jobs. But let me say to you tonight that whenever you are engaged in work that serves humanity and it is building for and it is for the building of humanity, it has a dignity and it has worth. One day our society must come to see this. 
One day our society will come to respect the sanitation worker if it is to survive for the person who picks up our garbage. In the final analysis, it is as significant as the physician. For if he doesn't do his job, diseases are rampant. All labor has dignity. But you are doing another thing. You are reminding not only Memphis, but you are reminding the nation that it is a crime for people to live in this rich nation and receive starvation wages. Do you know that most of the poor people in our country are working every day and they are making wages so low that they cannot begin to function the mainstream of the economic life for, of our nation? There are facts which must be seen and it is criminal to have people working on a full-time basis and a full-time job getting part-time income. You are here tonight to demand that Memphis will do something about the conditions that our brothers face as they work day in, day out for the well-being of the total community. You are here to demand that the Memphis will see the poor. Thank you. Solidarity with Dr. King and workers everywhere.